sorry. I, I'm sorry. Did, uh, did I say uh, good morning? Yes, there you are. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for being up this early, and especially from a fellow West Coast peeps. Holler, what's up? Yeah, 6 a.m. You're welcome. Um, so I am so thrilled to be here, and I'm, I'm especially, when I heard about the work that you all were doing, I, of course, made sure that I could be able to be here because um, you're going to soon learn that I have a special um, place in my heart for transfer students because I was one. Um, and I am here today to talk to you about uh, the real challenges facing higher ed, but I hope to leave you with a sense of optimism that we can actually fix most of the significant problems facing our students, facing our institutions. You don't have to be super powerful or super high up on the org chart. In fact, a lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about today, anyone could do, and it would make a measurable difference on your campus. Sound good? Okay, good. Glad you, you signed up for this ride. Um, so generally, when I am speaking, I start by explaining uh, a provocative fact, which is higher education is failing students. And that's something we should all be very concerned about, and we have to fix it. But I know that you already know that. I know that you're going to be the audience that's not going to be resistant to that fact because you see it every single day. Now, first, you heard a tiny bit about my background, but the part that really matters of my background is that I grew up in poverty in rural Montana, so you know I can turn anything into jerky. <laughs> uh, um, had the special pleasure, fellow Montanans, to graduate high school before getting vaccinated. Yeah. Um, and my parents were preppers. Do you, for those who don't know, preppers are the kind of people who their idea of fun is preparing for the end of the world. Yeah. Like Y2K is just like a little too soon to talk about in my family. It's like their Super Bowl that got canceled. But I got back at them as an adult by being woefully unprepared for most things in life, especially college. Um, I, so I grew up in this low-income family of four, living on $14,000 a year. Uh, my father had been paralyzed when I was two years old, so he didn't work, and my mom stayed home and took care of him. And so, you know, in my family, just like a lot of our students, there really wasn't a healthy talk about college. Uh, in fact, the only talk about college was when my dad would make jokes that, if I wanted to go, I should do what my brother did and win a state championship in wrestling. <laughs> Extremely helpful for an insecure, chubby 13-year-old girl. Um, so, you know, but like a lot of our students, I sifted through the bad advice I was given and I found some nuggets that I pieced together and that's what I followed. So what I took from that was, if you're exceptional at something, then you'll get to go to college. And so I focused on winning a state championship. I actually wrestled for a hot minute, but that was not a good look. Um, so I completely ignored my studies because I thought this was my path. If I'm exceptional at something, I'll get to go. And so when I finally barely eked out of high school, it was with a 2.3 GPA, but I was a state champion in debate. And it turns out that, uh, turns out there's not as much interest in like, uh, mediocre student that can argue about it <laughs> as there is for a Big Ten wrestler. So that's a healthy fact for you. Um, and so when I got to college, I went to a community college in northern Idaho. No one talked to me about my experience. I was handed a choose your own adventure map like we do for students. Um, never, never talked to an advisor. Didn't know what an advisor really was, didn't know how to use one, um, and didn't know when to kind of self-moderate. Uh, didn't go to office hours, because that seemed like a time when people were doing office work. Didn't want to didn't bother them. You see, there's all this language that we use, this inside baseball, that um, for a lot of our students is leaving them on the outside. Uh, I, you know, I navigated through two years of community college. I didn't graduate. Uh, with my passion, with my associates, I uh, my parents then got a divorce, and I uh, followed a, followed a dude 
per use. Um, a, lot of, a lot of those informed decisions our students make. Um, and I transferred to Oregon State University where I showed up and again, yeah, holler. Um, did not talk to an advisor, was handed another choose your adventure map, um, took really interesting classes that had nothing to do with my program of study. And uh, when I finally graduated, it was seven years later with a bachelor's, seven. Uh, and I had 50 extra credits that I didn't need because none of them transferred, turns out, and uh, $50,000 in student loans. Yeah, uh, and, and let's be clear, my story is the best case scenario, right? And you know this and you see this every day and you fight every day to try and fix it. So I feel like y'all are my peeps and I'm excited to share with you uh, what we've been finding, and hopefully it inspires you, but generally speaking, with what I have to share, um, sift through, find the stuff that works for you. If it works, great, use it. If it doesn't, ignore it. Good? Okay. So uh, what I had found in my whole academic journey is I had stumbled upon a dirty secret that we need to talk about, which is higher education was never designed around students. It turns out this is fundamentally underneath every single problem we're dealing with. And you know that if it was designed around students, it would definitely be an 18 to 22 year old, able-bodied, typically white, typically from a family with privilege, um, with a ton of advice, um, all kinds of, you know, all of the preferencing that we have in our systems that expect you to be this certain iconic thing that none of our students are these days. Um, when I usually talk about this, I'm not talking to my peeps. I'm talking to a lot of folks who are resistant when they hear this. They think, oh, no, that's not true. And all I have to do is explain one example that's true at every institution everywhere. Whenever I go to a college, um, no matter where I am, if I am asking, you know, how's your graduation process work? Uh, it's all the same, which is we, uh, when a student is ready to graduate, we don't know. The university doesn't know. The student has to tell us. And then when a student is ready to graduate, we then say, thanks for letting us know, here are some forms and paperwork. And lastly, you get to pay a fee. <laughs> now, if that's not bad design, I don't know what is. Um, and that's just one example, but it's pretty much everywhere that we, you know, if you were trying to check out at Amazon and it made you fill out paperwork and pay a fee to just, just finish your cart, um, you would get the signal that they don't actually want you to finish. And allegedly, graduation's kind of our jam, so we should probably fix it. Um, so this is not something that is intentional. This is not something that we planned. Nobody's actually like, um, you know, twisting their mustache in an ivory uh, tower somewhere. What's happened is that we are uh, essentially struggling with design that was never ours. When they first uh, created universities in this country, um, it's not a secret. People are always like, why is higher ed here? What's the purpose? Uh, no, it's written down, if you study the history of it. It was the uh, preservation of democracy. We were a baby democracy. We didn't want to be re-overtaken by the British. And so we knew that we needed to invest in, at the time, some of the intellectual capital of our citizens. But over time, we've learned we really need to invest in all of them. Um, but when we did that, we did something that most universities still do today. And that is we borrowed a model from elsewhere. So we looked at what universities looked like, and that's why all of you have a bursar. I don't know why else we all have the same weird named office um, <laughs> that is, students do not understand. Um, just kidding, for any of the bursars, love you. Um, so isomorphism is this, is this thing that we just replicate each other's design because that's what we see. It's why we're all kind of the Harvard of something, yeah. Nobody's actually the Harvard of anything. Um, what we did is we modeled this, we took this model and the problem is the design was originally around the faculty. Um, it was never around students. And uh, I don't say that meaning, uh, you know, here's the deal. Uh, it's true because that was the intellectual capital we needed to protect, but you know who's the most upset about that? Faculty. Because faculty have a front row seat, just like yourselves, every day to watch students walk out their door for a totally predictable reason, They've seen it 50 times before, and they've raised their hand as many times as they could, and nothing seems to change. So we know it's a design problem. It's not our fault. There aren't, it, I, I genuinely believe that people work in higher ed because they care, because somehow it changed their life, and they want to pay it forward. There's no other reason people work in higher ed. Um, and so 
Ultimately, this is something that we can work on to fix, but we have to know that the underpinning of our design is a value system that we're all changing slowly, but we have to at least acknowledge. The value system of the model we borrowed from abroad was it was designed around the few, not the many. And you know that we actually transfer students in particular, that, like, you know, some college no degree, like, th that's actually going to be the majority, right? Um, that it was also designed uh, around the idea that rare means good. That's our best model of whether something is quality, is that you can't get in. But that's like saying, like, my doctor is really good, I've never seen him, can't get in with them, but, like, they must be super good. Um, <laughs> But lastly, and, and most concerningly, is this belief that if a student drops out, that it's on them. They failed. And really, we failed them. Um, the other piece of this is that for low-income, first-generation, and students of color, there is this somehow this thought that, OK, we'll solve. If they drop out, we'll just we'll bolt on a program. We'll create a center for them. And what we're missing is that they are the leading indicator for all of it and that actually we should focus our attention on low-income, first-generation, and students of color because when they get tripped up and when they drop out, it's, always, it's usually for a very similar reason as the rest of students. They're just a student, but they have an extra backpack of challenge, right? They're working three jobs. They live in a racist society. They are following terrible advice, and they are not good wrestlers. Okay? So they are just a student. Most of the time they trip up because uh, over communication, under communication, they actually didn't have anyone to explain to them and help them through the process. Yes, there are financial things that pop up, but those usually you can see those inside the system by looking for alerts that they don't find because our system is never designed around them. Okay? So this is the background to everything. The good news is we can solve this. Um, but the, the challenging part of it is this challenge that I just talked about is showing up in the data. And I want to make sure we're all clear about what the challenge is facing all of higher education right now. And that is that right now we're facing a shortfall of college degrees of somewhere around 11 million students. What that means for us is that we're simply we're producing a lot of degrees, some of them not for what the what workforce needs, so we need to definitely realign with workforce, but we also fail half of all the people who walk in the door. Okay? And we need to step up, we need to produce more high quality degrees that actually give people the skills that they need to compete in a marketplace that is changing and a future of work, right? So more people, more. Problem is, this is uh, where we are when it comes to our population. For the first time in US history, low income students are the majority in public K-12. So the students who we are going to be coming, if they're coming in through that door, are going to be from a low-income background. And that is something that is problematic because it's a, that's a background that we don't do very well with. Um, this is the history of how well we serve that population. So um, it's a, this isn't a slide we've been showing for a long time. Unfortunately, it hasn't really changed. It's income quartile graduation. The top income quartile, that blue line, if you were born into a wealthy family back in the 70s, you had a 40% chance of getting a bachelor's degree. We've doubled that. Yay, awesome, good job. Uh, my, uh, my peeps are down here in the red, which back in the 70s, you had six out of every hundred got a bachelor's degree. And after all of our focus on progress and innovation, it's now about 9%. So nine out of 100. Not the best odds. Uh, it turns out the one thing we've done is doubled our achievement gap. So we have to serve more students, we have to do a better job, and we have got to stop repeating the same mistakes of the past. Because it turns out we've learned some things, we've just never actually learned from them. We've never given ourselves time to talk about failure, to reflect on what others have figured out, and to create communities where it's safe to actually engage in experimentation and be able to figure these things out. And I'm not just saying these things uh, because I'm hopeful and optimistic that we can figure this out. It's because I've spent the past six years working with a group of universities who have been actively doing this. And what I'm going to share with you now for the rest of my time with you today is what we've learned so you don't have to make the mistakes we did. Um, 
these are the University Innovation Alliance campuses. Uh, the UIA was something that was an idea. It was 11 presidents and chancellors got united around a sense of urgency, that we were not producing enough college degrees, that we were doing a terrible job with low income, first generation, and students of color, and that we had to find a way to innovate and scale up what works instead of tinkering in silos separately. And so these campus leaders didn't know each other, didn't trust each other, had no reason to talk to each other, um, except that they were just all noticing the same problem. And here's how the conversation goes, because you, you can replicate it. Uh, hey, uh, what are you doing? Uh, cool, I think I'm doing the same thing, but I don't know. Maybe I could learn from what you're doing. What, you know, can you, can you explain to me what you learned? That was simply it which is kind of the same conversation you can have with colleagues here. It's, it's setting up a community of practice wherever you are. You don't need to be a president or chancellor. You have power sitting in your seat right now. You have the colleagues around you to have the kinds of provocative and important conversations that can change the future of your institution. So why, do, why am I telling you about this? I'm not gonna talk a lot about the Alliance. I'm just gonna tell you what we learned. Um, what, what we did is we committed to a very ambitious goal. We were gonna produce a lot more degrees 68,000. Uh, we're now on track to produce 130,000 in that same time period. We have increased our low income graduates in five years by 29%, which means 30,000 additional Pell graduates have, have, we have come about than there we were going to five years prior. Okay, um, and we've raised $30 million uh, for this work, which is not, it's not about the fundraising, it's that the campuses match the money. Right? So this is not about the money philanthropy can, what they can pay us to do. This is about what we can do, to, how can we change how we are spending our resources? How can we use kind of seed money to get out of the starting blocks and try some new things and be able to use and leverage all of our own resources to shift the future of our campuses? Um, so these, these leaders have really been able to set a trend and now people are starting to copy and that's exactly what we wanted. We just wanted, we want to innovate, we want to scale up and we want to diffuse and give away everything we've learned. So that's what I'm gonna do. Um, but that's all you need to know about the Alliance. To make this real in your world, you have to know that I didn't get this idea from, well, first off, it wasn't my idea, but I, we didn't get this idea from higher ed. And so the first thing I wanna make sure you understand is the good ideas are not in higher ed. You need to be inspired by other places. Do you know what we were inspired by? Weight Watchers. Yeah, uh, I'm currently in Dub Dub, um, and so, I, and I, but I'd done it before, and it was just a very simple idea that you can create a community of practice for something that's hard for everyone to do. Okay, innovating's hard, losing weight hard, basic principles. Um, with Weight Watchers, it's just very simple, is that uh, no one can sign you up for Weight Watchers. You have to decide that you're gonna do it. You have your own goal, right? In the UIA, I, I'm not gonna try and evangelize. I'm not trying to convince people to care about these students. You either do or you don't, and I'm ready to create the space for you to be able to accelerate progress. So you come in the door at Weight Watchers, you decide it. The second thing is, there's a cute little old lady, usually, who's um, super sweet, and you, you stand on a scale and you weigh yourself, right? Um, it's generally a little old lady, and she's adorable. Um, we have a data sharing agreement. We transparently share all of our data. And we have a weigh-in annually about our achievement gap, because that's what we're trying to eliminate, right? Same data, so the same thing, which is we're all gonna make progress. The key thing about Weight Watchers, when you make progress, yay, celebrate you. When you don't, that's okay. You see, in higher ed, shame everywhere does not work. If it worked, if it was an effective tool, it would have worked, okay? There's plenty of it. Um, we actually think that you can get a lot more with honey and highlighting and praising and making sure that people know that they're on track. The most important part about Weight Watchers is you go in some back room and you have a bunch of other people who are struggling with the same thing and you have a safe place to talk about, hey, cookies literally haunt me at night. <laughs> because they do. <laughs> Have you guys met about, heard about these carbs things? Oh, legit. Um, so you have a, and, and you, you're exchanging tips and tricks with each other. And that's something you can create right now, right? All you have to do is, I have a similar goal. I'm gonna be accountable to you in, in some way that works for both of us. But what I wanna do is be able to brainstorm with you about what are you learning? What's helped you? What, here's what I'm struggling with. 
We have to have, uh, we need to create more space for social safety and vulnerability, and that's how ideas spread. Um, the, we know that this works because, you know, in the end, 29% increase in, in low-income students, that's awesome. And I just want to tell you that taking ideas from other places is where you're going to get the inspiration, right? Healthcare, there are other communities out there that have tried to figure out how to solve transfer of patients who have tried to figure out how to actually help with the completion of an outcome. And it's not always higher ed where the best ideas are. So I want to encourage you to be creative and look elsewhere. So we're going to talk briefly about some of the challenges that are getting in the way, and um, I want to make sure that I'm not just uh, bumming you out and telling you all the things that are, um, are sad and terrible. So that's my promise for you. But I did read quite a bit about what you're struggling with, and I want to just prepare you for an image you're about to see. Um, this is what you look like. <laughs> are you okay with that? Yeah, this is actually the biggest problem, to, the, the threat to student success and to improvement. It's capacity. You're super overwhelmed. You're doing five jobs. Um, you're never actually given the time to work on your work. So the one, I want to give you permission to fight for this because I'm telling you, I spend time at a lot of universities and this is actually the issue. Uh, it, you do not need more time. You, know, you spend most of your time on email. You most, spend most of your time going to terrible meetings. Um, you need time to actually think of ideas. They do not actually interrupt a, a terrible meeting. You, you need time to brainstorm with partners. You need space to be able to work on your design. That is the first thing that's going to matter. It's going to be intentional use of your time. And when you do get time, though, uh, I do want to warn you that this is, you know, when you, when you finally have a second to reach out to a friend or an ally and ask, hey, what are you learning? This is what it feels like to talk to universities. <laughs> yeah, we only share our headlines and the things that are going great, but the truth is things aren't always that great. In fact, every college and university in this room has a million dollar failure on your campus. We just don't talk about it. And by not doing that, what we're doing is sentencing other people to repeat our mistakes. And students are the ones who write those checks. So we have got to change how higher ed communicates with each other. We need to create space where it's okay to talk about the things that didn't work, because I promise you there are a lot of them. Another thing uh, that's important that happens is I get invited to campuses all the time, and whenever I show up, they, they kind of want to show me their awesome program or this learning community, and we have this innovative idea. It's a, it's a thing. And what I always ask is, like, what's your plan? What, uh, you know, how do, why did you choose that thing first? What, what's the thing you're gonna do next? What's the goal? Who's the team? Just like, do you have a plan? And um, when every single campus that I walk into, uh, it's, you know, have you ever been to the gym and it's like this? You see, <laughs> yeah. Like, this is what's like, I walk on a campus and they're always like, look at all the stuff we're doing. And I'm like, it, I don't know why you chose that, but I'm not sure that's what you should be doing, <laughs> right? Um, so you need a plan. You actually need, uh, here's how we're gonna know we're successful. Um, here's how we're gonna measure it. Here's who's on the team. Here's why we're doing it. This is why we're choosing this thing now, and next we're gonna try this thing, okay? But very simple, you need a plan. And you, you get that plan by actually spending some time with each other. Um, the other thing that really is important and needs to be addressed is there's a lot of tools. I know you all have been told predictive analytics or this or boobity bop. Uh, there are a lot of tools out there, but if you don't use them well, <laughs> they're not going to change your life. Yeah. So I want to encourage you to consider that, that perhaps uh, when you get a new tool, you actually need to take a beat and not just listen to the contractor telling you, oh yeah, we just like plug it in, it's like a jump drive. <laughs> so great. I've heard that from so many predictive analytics vendors, which is not true. Um, you actually need to take a beat and understand, okay, so what's our approach going to be to make sure that this works? Here's, uh, let's first figure out what's going wrong and make sure that we're, we're putting the jump drive in the right area. Um, so. The last piece you understand is that uh, presidents, chancellors, provosts, all of these people, fancy people, high ups, uh, they don't know either. 
And I just want to give you the permission that whatever the dumb question that you don't want to speak up about in a meeting, you need to because it's actually the right question and you're not the only one with it. Whenever I go to universities, if I can get them to actually drop their guard and talk privately with me, um, no matter what the student success problem, this is kind of what it's like uh, in terms of how they feel. <laughs> Student success is not like, it's not like arrow up, arrow over, arrow down. It's not super easy to fix and diagnose how to, how to change your transfer pipeline. It's not how, articulation agreements, we can focus on them all we want, we can look at good examples of them, but that doesn't make it just happen, right? It's actually, there's a little bit of alchemy in here, and so that's why you need a team, and you need time to work on it, and you need to actually give yourself the permission to create a strategy, but I am telling you that nobody else has the answers necessarily, and you have have permission and you need to be brave by asking what you think is the dumb question because I'm promising you they all don't know the answer either. So I want to take a second real quick. Uh, you've been sitting for a hot, hot second and uh, don't worry, she'll keep doing this. Um, if, you're, if you're physically able, could you please stand for a second? And uh, you want to stretch a little bit, okay? So here's a little uh, factoid. Uh, your brain produces a protein called uh, BDNS, which is brain-derived neurotropic factor. Um, when you produce this protein naturally, uh, it helps you retain new information. After you've been sitting for 20 minutes, you produce less of it. How long are our lectures? <laughs> Yeah, so the next time that you're given a hard time about uh, having to sit through yet another terrible meeting, uh, 20 minutes, just a little stretch break, okay? Feel free if you wanna stand along the walls, like um, it's just not really good and healthy for you to sit this long and just like take in information, okay? All right, you can have a seat if you'd like. Um, so you're gonna need a strategy for failure. So I wanna, um, I wanna make sure that we're giving ourselves a little bit of time right now. And so for the next two minutes, here's the thing. Your campuses and you in your departments, in your areas, you need an autopsy process. You've been doing stuff. Some of it hasn't worked out. But you have to shove it under the rug, move on to the next thing. That's not helping. So I want you to think for a second of something that has failed on your campus recently. Now, you got an idea? I mean, that was easy, right? Something that didn't work out? How did your campus treat it? How did you treat that failure? Did you talk about it? Did you debrief it? Was there any examination of maybe how to not do that same thing again? Can you turn and talk with your neighbor for the next minute and just share how did you, what, what was the failure and from what you observed, what was the process of how you treated it? You have permission to speak. <laughs> you get people talking about failure, they love it. This is good stuff. Treasure trove. There is a treasure trove of knowledge in here. All right. You, did you all catch that vibe? This seems like a topic that you maybe haven't talked about. This is the next subject of your team meeting. When you go back home, we're gonna talk about what is our process for unpacking failure and making sure we learn from it. Because every campus needs an autopsy process and they don't have one. And I don't mean to say, hey, what did you fail at lately? The way that you can create social safety for this is here's something that I did and I led that didn't turn out how I expected and here's what I learned from it. Focus on the learning, not on the failure. Okay, but you all, this is one of the tools that it is a ripe conversation for you to have with your team. I also wanna just tell you, you need a team. This is one of the most, the biggest innovations in the field. The idea that you cannot do everything by yourself. Um, we made all of our campuses form a student success team. It turns out they didn't have one prior. That is a problem. I realize that you work with lots of people, but whatever the big problem that you're working on, the big challenge, the implementation you're trying to do that you were asked to do, it touches other people, doesn't it? There's some other department, you need something from someone, data. So these teams are, uh, they're cross-functional, they're IR, financial aid, advisors, super important to have advisors. Uh, the people who care and touch and, and interact with students, right? Um, and they just need, you need to meet monthly. And here's the thing, you need not to have a really strict agenda. You need actually just space. 
because we will ruin any meeting, right? And I gotta tell you, having a meeting, not an outcome. Somebody needed to hear that today, right? Um, you, and, it, and by the way, you're all a part of terrible committees. Committees are about communication. Teams are about action. A team means you have a goal. A team has a plan. A team is checking in regularly because you're on a team, right? You need to form a team. You can disband that committee if you want to. And by the way, every committee usually has like a wet sock on it. And if you don't know who the wet sock is, <laughs> yeah. So just feel free to, uh, you know, unvolunteer people. And you can actually, by just reconstituting a team, just don't invite the wet sock, okay? That's hashtag innovation. <laughs> so um, one thing that I want to talk to you about that's probably the most important thing you're going to get from me just right now, but I want to invite you that later on today we're going to be holding a workshop to teach you this skill, is a very simple idea that you can use on any problem you have. And once you have a team or don't have a team, this is going to give you the roadmap. So uh, how many of you have heard of Georgia State's transformation story? Okay, well, they've, they're, you know, the national model for student success. They've eliminated race and income as a predictor of outcome. Um, and they've done it by not changing who they admit. Because most people who increase their graduation rates just stop admitting poor people. Did I say that? Yeah, because it's true. Um, anyone who, if you manipulate your entrance requirements, then you didn't do anything innovative to, to improve your outcomes. And um, so that happens all the People are always like, yeah, we did that. No, no, you just changed who you let in. Georgia State did not do that. They actually transformed their institution. They are the first ones who really kind of led on predictive analytics, uh, chatbots, all of this stuff. But when you hear their story, it's very overwhelming because you're like, uh, what do I look at? You know, there's so much going on. This is where they started. This is where you can start. Um, it's called process mapping. How many of you have? Oh, cool, awesome. So process mapping is a very basic concept I did not invent. Um, Georgia State did not invent. It's a very common thing in business strategy. And it, it just basically is, you gotta see how the current system is if you're gonna try and change it. And you don't need to pay a high price consultant to do this. Turns out, we're gonna train you in this. We're gonna give you a little sample baby training this afternoon. Um, here's what you need, this really innovative technology. Uh, it's a post-it note. <laughs> um, and what you do is uh, you actually just put a post-it note up for each step in a process, every piece of communication. So Georgia State did that, and they basically figured out how they were getting in the way of students, how they were the problem. Right, and that's kind of, we have to assume we're the problem, university's the problem. The transfer pipeline, the, the challenges, the policies and procedures that were designed for the administrators, they're the problem. So how the UIA works is we bring people together, they share things that they've done to help each other, right? Well, one of our campuses, Michigan State, left our convening from, and hearing about this process mapping thing, um, went and sent someone to get trained in it, and uh, they got everyone who worked on student success in one room for the first time in the history of the university. And they just decided they wanted to focus on a three month period of time, from the day the student gets admitted to the day they show up on campus. And they focused on first time, full time freshmen. Okay. When they did that, they mapped out and put a post-it note for every email for every step, for every financial aid hold, all that. And when they stood back, and keep in mind, they're all in the same room together. So no, no, this is not like a plume of smoke comes up and you're told what the problem is. Like It gets buy-in in the room. You can actually br build and galvanize energy and momentum. They took a step back and there were 450 post-it notes. Three month window of time which means they were sending 350 or 450 emails to every student from msu.edu. And if you don't know what your number is, it's 490, okay? We are over communicating, under communicating, total, like we are, we're sending terrible messages. For first gen students, this is a problem. You know, I wish someone would have sent me the right message about who an advisor was and how to actually navigate the student pathway, but instead they were telling me to sign up for like softball, okay? And then in the midst of all those emails is, here's a financial aid deadline that you just missed, 
okay? Um, higher ed, we ruined email. <laughs> we'll ruin Facebook, we'll ruin Snapchat, <laughs> we'll ruin Instagram, until we actually fix this. So 450 post-it notes. They also found, and this is something you all understand, there were 50 types of holds a student could have on their account the university didn't know about. So they didn't know, but the students were somehow just running into them. So this is a very simple method. All you do is we'll give you the parameters, though we'll actually give you some post-it notes, and you're gonna get a chance to run through this and figure out how you could do this. In every place in your work, you can process map Frankly, how agendas are set. You can process map how workflow is happening on your team. You can process map the transfer process because we've done that and we found it's not what you think it is. Um, you cannot bring in new ideas to a toxic space if you don't know what's actually going wrong right now. So process mapping costs zero money. Oh yes, holler. Um, costs zero money uh, other than post-it notes. I think we're keeping them in business. <laughs> Um, so I want to give you just the last few pieces that are going to be helpful for you. Um, one, you need habits. Uh, I recently became a meditator after years of trying. I stopped focusing on meditating. I focused on the habit of meditation. I do it every morning. I don't do it perfectly, but I do it every morning. Sometimes for a minute, sometimes for two, sometimes for 20. Who cares? I want, if you stop focusing on being perfect, but you actually think about what are the kind of habits that, it, a, a, that an organization that, that improves student success, what kind of habits would they have? How often would I check in on my data? How often would I have a meeting? I want you to think about, and this is another topic you can bring back with your team, what are the kinds of habits a team that eliminates the achievement gap in the transfer pathway, what kind of habits would they have? How often would they check in on things? How often would they talk about certain subjects? How often would they have brainstorms? Because that's what you need. You need free time to think because your brains are overwhelmed. Um, you also, I would just say innovation can be anywhere. There's this habit right now, there we go, of universities to create vice presidents for innovation and a center for innovation as if only the innovation exists there. And I think that's like really demoralizing and it sends a message that the people who've already signed up and spent their lives in this field are not innovative. What I see is that they are weighed down. And so we look at it that uh, the innovators are actually in this room, they're in our institutions, they just need some help. So we hired early to mid-career professionals, we call them fellows. For you it could be a project manager, maybe it's a graduate assistant, maybe it's just someone who actually is looking for an opportunity, a student who wants to help out. But the way we look at it is they come in and we find the person who's in charge of student success and we give them that person as a chief of staff to lighten their load. And now the people who already are there have time to innovate. They have actually time to think. Um, so I just want to encourage you to rethink the idea that you need some, some permission to think creatively about your workload. And I know that's a luxury to, to have extra time, but just um, if you need, I've, there's plenty of stuff we put out online. If you have a vice president for innovation or a center for innovation, first off, do not tell them to call me, um, but you can actually share this information internally. Um, one of the last pieces is that, uh, you know, these are all the things that we've done. None of them are done. It, ba it basically just means we started each year. Like each of those boxes looks so clean. Look at those colors, so pretty, I did that. Um, we're still figuring out predictive analytics. We're still figuring out college to career. It's like you just start one thing at a time. And I just wanna give you permission to try and focus on one thing at a time. The most innovative places do not just do the poo-poo platter of all the things, right? And that's what's happening in our gym where we're doing those weird leg lifts, okay? And so I just wanna encourage you to think about what are we doing this year? We're gonna focus on this because we wanna be successful. And next year we're gonna focus on that. As you are trying to talk about transfer and student success, I wanna give you guidance about how to advise and give this information to your senior leaders. So I work with college presidents a lot and you just have to know that they are super overwhelmed and whenever they interact with someone, they either that person either works for them or uh, wants something from them. And most of the time, people are just handing problems to them, and it's overwhelming. So if you are trying to figure out how you can get a decision made by a senior leader, here is how you do it. Uh, President booby doo boop Instead of just saying, I have a problem, we have a problem, because all they have is problems, and that's just me taking my problem and putting it in your backpack. What you say is, 
Uh, when you have time in an email, fine, but uh, we, have a ch we have an issue. Uh, it's a problem, uh, but don't worry. I've already researched two other campuses who've had the same problem. I've talked to them about the things they considered and the decisions they made, the costs and benefits. And I've vetted this against where we are internally, where we have capacity. And my recommendation is that we have two choices, one and two. And I've vetted them, and my recommendation to you is number one, and I also suggest that if you want to do number one, that this is the team that we comprise, and here's how we do it. And I am looking forward to talking to you about just making sure that that's what you want to do, but here's all the information. If you, do, if you say something like that, first off, you're promoted. Right? You just, because you're not just giving, you're not just contributing decision fatigue, you're actually helping, you, you've vetted the problems, you've identified the path, and you're making a recommendation. Leaders do not want to talk to you about the problem. They want, they trust that you're a professional who's smart, and they want, I want you to do the due diligence to identify what the possible solutions are, weigh them, be paranoid on their behalf, and present that information in a way that's easy for them where you're not just weighing them down with the problem. The other piece is there's something called story brand. There's a book, Story Brand, Donald Miller. If you're trying to figure out how to tell the story of transfer students, I would recommend that. Um, we learned from this that essentially, uh, here's the headline, you're not the hero. The institution's not the hero. Your program is not the hero. The student is the hero. You are the guide. Tell the stories of students. You have things that you can use you can take a video, put it on YouTube, no one's going to stop you. Well, I mean, unless you have some weird lawyer, who's whatever. Um, but you can tell these stories of these students. You, you see the, stor the stories of students every day, and the best way for you to be able to advocate for your work is to be able to uh, share that narrative, share that nuance of here's this, here's this student's voice walking you through how they ran into that problem. If you want to get attention around a problem that you know needs to be solved, then do it through the method of student voice. Um, if you can get them to share with you, if they are have to anonymize, then you can write it up. But um, I think that StoryBrand will be a helpful thing. They have an online workshop, they have a book, there's a simple process that you can follow through, and that really helped me talking about our work. Um, but lastly, I just wanna encourage you, as you leave, the last thing to talk about with your team is, when was the last time you had good ideas, new ideas? Right? Was it when uh, you know, Sarah went to that conference? Was it that time that you had an unconference? Was that time that you had a meeting with so-and-so? I just wanna give you the encouragement to have a, have, a, have a conversation about the last time a new idea came to your institution or you had an idea to solve a problem. And then I want you to think about, if you don't talk about those things, you don't get to have more of them. I want you to have more ideas. You have the creative juices to be able to solve your problems. And all of the friends and allies that you're going to have here at this conference, they want to help you. But I want to encourage you to have specific conversations about the strategy for failure for you and your team, for where you get new ideas, for what kind of habits would be helpful for you if you were going to be successful. And I also want to encourage you to come to our process mapping session if you want to learn that skill this afternoon. But in the end, the only thing you need to know is that you heard my story. You heard all the hard things. That's fine. What you need to know is that I wouldn't change a thing. In fact, my favorite day of the month is the day I pay my student loans. It's, I mean, if you think about it, it's like a guaranteed every month, a gratitude check-in. Because I, I remember being terrified that it wasn't gonna work out and not sure that I should bet on myself, and I did. And every month it's a reminder to bet, my, bet on myself that it was worth it, that college totally paid off. And that's true for many of your students. I just wanna let you know how much I appreciate the work that you do, and I'm so grateful for you making the investment of your time. You could do anything with your time this morning, especially if you're as tired as those West Coasters are. <laughs> And it's been an honor to talk with you today, and I'm happy to, to share with you some more. But thank you so much for having me, and I wish you best. <laughs>